Hey, church, go ahead and give it up for Michael DeGroat again. Sometimes we, um, we practice celebrating each other because it's important to celebrate um, how God is working through people. So it's never about just one person or a group. You know, a lot of times I want to get up here and say, hey, give it up for the band. It's like, what I'm really wanting to say is how great is it that God has given us incredible gifts and talents? And he was so kind to let us use them for him. That's what Michael DeGroat is doing with his life right now. I want to brag on him because he would not do it himself. And so I get to do that. So, Michael, I get to celebrate you this morning and set the bar real high before you preach. That's um, great. And, and he said his sermon's only five minutes long, so I have 20 minutes. <laughs> so, um, Michael has positioned his life. Um, he and his family, they've positioned their life in a way where he can give back of his time. Um, so he has a day job. And, and he's in the finance world and he works with people and does a great job doing that. But he's positioned his life very strategically in a way that he can give back of his time. And for years now, truthfully years, he's been sharing with us as a staff and, and leadership about how he wants to give back. And finally, um, we had an opportunity to be, be able to engage a need that we had at this church um, in the departure of our beloved Cheryl Reed, who led um, global outreach and service for so many years we had a way to be able to engage Michael where his passion meets a point for us that we needed some help in. And so it's really beautiful when God does that. It just so turns out that God lets us live into our God-given purpose. And for such a time as this, Michael's been able to step into um, our staff team as the director of global outreach. So Michael, thank you in advance for one, um, setting your life up with intentionality in a way that allows you to give back. Um, in a very profound way. And two, for being bold enough to continue to knock on our door and say, hey, I want to serve. I want to serve. Hey, you're not hearing me. I want to serve. Are you guys listening? I want to serve, right? That was other leaders. But, but God has been faithful through Michael to make sure that, um, that God continued to put on Michael's heart a desire for service. And it is just a beautiful uh, partnership that we have right now. And so I'm excited for you to hear from him. But really what I wanted you to hear this morning in my little um, uh, invitation to him and affirmation of him is that this is an example of a, of a man living out his God-given purpose every day. And he's doing it in creative, um, curated kind of ways. And he's designed his life in a way that allows him to do that. And it requires intentionality and sacrifice. So as we live into our mission here at Fellowship Dallas and we call each other to live out our God-given purpose in Christ every day, I just want to remind you um, that you're doing it and that there are people in your midst that are doing it as well. And I want to continue to cast a vision for you that this is a way for you to partner not just with Fellowship Dallas, right, Michael? Not just here in this local church, but more importantly with what God is doing in the world. And God is bringing his world to full redemption, and we get to participate in that. How kind of a father we serve. So Michael, thank you for serving. Thank you for leading so well. He's gonna share a little bit more about what director of global outreach actually means, but before we do that, I'd love to pray for him. Um, and I would love for you to be able to embrace him this morning. So thank you in advance for doing that. Father, thank you for your son, Michael. Thank you for how you have gifted him and put a passion on his heart to serve. Thank you for the sacrifice and intentionality um, that he has uh, practiced in his life. Thank you for the willingness to be bold and to be courageous and to continue to step up. Thank you for how you have um, just incredibly gifted him to serve the least of these in the world. God, would you bless him this morning? Would you give him the words to say? Would your Holy Spirit guide him? And your, would your Holy Spirit speak through him this morning to inspire and to encourage a body of people who love you? God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for allowing us to partner with what you're doing in the world. And we're so grateful to serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's all downhill from here. <laughs> Caleb, thank you. But truthfully, all glory be to Christ. Uh, I do, I, I volunteer here on staff as the global outreach director. And what that means is I spend a lot of time connecting with and talking with our missionary partners all over the globe. And I also spend time organizing and preparing mission trips for us as a congregation to go on to share the love of Christ. 
I spent some of my childhood overseas as a missionary. In 1995, uh, my father felt a stirring in his heart to drop everything, career, uh, established life, and comfort, and to move the whole family to the far east of Russia, beyond Siberia. In response to that call, my father prayed, Lord, I'll go if you want me to. More on that story later. This morning, we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about how to respond to God's call. We're going to talk about an update on what God is doing around the world and his invitation to us to partner in that with him. And so I want to let you know I'm recruiting, or more specifically, the Holy Spirit is recruiting. We're looking for people who would be involved in giving and going and serving God around the world. I am reminded of a story of a man who wanted to find a life verse, a verse to help him make choices and to guide his life. And so he got a Bible like this with a good flop factor, maybe a spaghetti spine, and uh, probably even better than this one. He decided what he was going to do is flip it open, close his eyes, point to a verse, and let that be the life verse to guide his life. So he flopped it open, closed his eyes, pointed and read, and he slipped off his shirt and ran away naked. Oh, no. Well, maybe we're just getting warmed up. Let's do two out of three. We're just getting started. We'll just do two out of three. So he closed his eyes, flipped it open. Yep, this feels like somewhere else. Good. Checked. Go now and do likewise. Okay, three, three out of five. And then I might have to get a different Bible. We'll see. Closed his eyes, flopped it open right here. And what you do, doest quickly. That uh, humorously illustrates how we have to be careful when we look at scripture to find purpose and meaning in our life. And so we will try to do that carefully this morning. What we're going to do is compare and contrast two famous calls, two men in the Old Testament who were called to do ministry work. They are separated by about 800 years, and yet their stories are strikingly similar at places. We can learn from the similarities in their stories and the differences. It's also important to know that these calls aren't normative. This isn't the normal way that God calls people, although because he's God, he can call people any way he wants to. But it's pretty unlikely that even though God does have a calling for your life, it's pretty unlikely it's going to happen for you this way. So don't be looking for it to happen this way. Let's start with a man in an identity crisis. He was adopted, and that seems to have left him maybe a bit confused about his family and belonging. He's lonely. He's the only one his age because the king had every baby killed when he was born, except him. So he doesn't have any friends his age. He's a fugitive currently running from the consequences of committing murder. He's a man without a clear home, separated from his people. He maybe wonders who even are my people. On top of this, he seems to have a debilitating anxiety. Please turn with me in your Bible to Exodus chapter 3. This is the call of Moses. We're going to work through this conversation between Moses and God, verse by verse. And we're going to see that Moses is a man with a low view of himself and worse, a low understanding of who God is. And we'll see that when we don't know who God is, we have a flawed understanding of who we are and what we're supposed to do. Exodus 3, verse 1. One day, Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire in the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. 
Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses. Here I am, Moses replied. Uh, When God calls to you, answering him is a good start. Don't come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Moses recognizes and respects God's name and title. That's building on his good start. Now God's going to give him very specific instructions. Notice how much God says I in this next section. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now, go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people out of Egypt? Uh Uh-oh. Moses makes a wrong turn here. It isn't smart to protest God. Some translations might say said instead of protested. I really like how this translation highlights what Moses is really doing. God has been making statements about his own identity, but Moses is absorbed by distracting self-focus, and he's worried about himself. Some of you do this too. You're consumed by anxiety and self-doubt that hinders you from living out your God-given purpose. I've been there. Recall also that Moses is wanted for murder in Egypt, and he's established a life where he is now. So God's call is going to mess all that up. Doing the comfortable thing isn't always the God-honoring thing. Verse 12, God answered, I will be with you. Moses, you're focused on the wrong who here. And this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. Isn't that odd? God's sign of encouragement and comfort to Moses, his sign that he is with Moses now in this moment, is that something will happen in the future. God is asking Moses to trust him. But Moses protested. If I go to the people of Israel and tell them, the God of your ancestors has sent me, They will ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? God has already answered this question. Remember at the start in verse 6? Moses' anxiety is getting the best of him. I I get that you keep telling me who you are, but uh, who are you? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. 
God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my eternal name, my name to remember for all generations. Moses is pushing back. When God When Moses asks God, who are you? God responds with this confusing, I am that I am. Uh, There's a vast amount of deep theology and meaning in that answer. But for today, let's simply note that the confusing answer is again an invitation to trust. We see a patient God continue to ask Moses to trust him. Uh, I'll summarize some of the next section here. In the following verses, God repeats the same call and instructions to Moses, adding even more detail. He even tells him exactly how it will all end. Remember, God knows the future. So now we are at chapter 4, verse 1. But Moses protested again. What if they won't believe me or listen to me? What if they say, the Lord never appeared to you? I I don't know how I feel about Moses in this moment. It's a mix. I'm confused because there's a voice talking from a burning bush that early on you recognized as God and hid your face from him, and now you're in this debate about whether you should trust him or not. I'm also sympathetic. There's a nice bit of Texas... Oh, bless your heart, Moses. I feel for you, man. Am I mad at him? Yeah, I might be a little bit. But God, in the next verse, meets Moses where he is. He gives Moses the power of three miracles. God is gracious to Moses, and he's being so patient with him. He's patient with us, too. After the miracles, we we pick up at verse 10. But Moses pleaded with the Lord. Oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I never have been, and I'm not now, even though you have spoken to me. I get tongue-tied, and my words get tangled. That could have been a speech impediment, or it could have been just that anxiety. Have you ever felt inadequate for the task God has for you? In the military, there is a system to classify those who have ailments that will disqualify them from service. It's called classification 4F. And if you've seen Captain America, you may remember the scene where Steve Rogers is desiring to enlist in the army for World War II, and he receives a classification 4F, disqualified. You cannot enlist and serve, and he's disappointed. That's the way the world works, those who are qualified and those who are unqualified. That is not the way the kingdom works. Let's see how God responds. Then the Lord asked Moses, who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak, hear or do not hear, see or do not see? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will be with you as you speak, and I will instruct you in what to say. If you've felt inadequate, take heart that God is always enough. God isn't limited by our inabilities. Moses' perceived inadequacy does not disqualify him from God's call. When we trust God, there is no longer anything that disqualifies us from serving God because God uses us as we are and makes us into who he needs us to be. Verse 13, but Moses again pleaded, Lord, please send anyone else. Some translations say, Moses said, Lord, Please send anyone you want. Of course, Moses means except for me. (laughs) Yikes, this is a bad response to God, direct refusal. Some of you have been there. 
Maybe you're there right now, directly refusing to do something God has asked of you. I also wonder though, do we ever refuse God indirectly with an attitude that just says, oh, someone else will do that, or I'll leave that to the professional Christians. While God's plan will succeed with or without you, no one else can live out your God-given purpose for you. Moses is so afraid. It's normal to be fearful, but that's not an excuse for obedience. When I have led mission trips uh, with young people on them, do you know the number one question I get in advance from their moms? That's right. Is it safe? My answer is usually not what mom expects. I say, if God has told them to go, is it safe to make them stay? Verse 14, then the Lord became angry with Moses. This took God a lot longer than it took me. God is so patient with Moses, and even in his anger, he provides the following solution. All right, he said, what about your brother, Aaron the Levite? I know he speaks well, and look, he's on his way to meet you now. He will be delighted to see you. Talk to him and put the words in his mouth. I will be with both of you as you speak, and I will instruct you both in what to do. Aaron will be your spokesman to the people, and he will be your mouthpiece. And you will stand in the place of God for him, telling him what to say. And take your shepherd's staff with you and use it to perform the miraculous signs I have shown you. A big lesson we see here is that serving God requires that we trust God. Serving in a way that pleases him requires us to trust him. You may recall these two verses. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, Hebrews eleven six, And to obey is better than sacrifice, 1 Samuel 15, 22. Uh, In preparation for this sermon, I looked up some studies on the state of trust in America. It's down a lot. Americans are less trusting today than we were a generation ago. Kids don't stay out until the street lamps come on at night anymore. We distrust the government. We distrust school systems. We are distrusting of the police, politicians, even if they happen to be our specific flavor. There's a crisis of trust in churches in our culture today. Banks, we've heard in the news, some of them have failed recently, and so we don't trust banks. And Americans are now less trusting of each other than we used to be. I wonder if living in a culture of distrust will make it harder for us to trust God because we're out of practice and we don't see it as important or safe. Even so, God is infinitely trustworthy. Those other things might not merit your trust, but God does. Let's leave Moses for now and jump forward 800 years. Again, Israel is displaced and they need a voice to guide them. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter six. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings, With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook. 
and the temple was filled with smoke. I love this part of scripture. It's one of the few places we get a glimpse into heaven. Isaiah says he saw God, but then he only describes the things around God, his robe, the building, the angels, and all of them are so deeply awesome. How much grander must God be? Verse five, woe to me, I cried, for I am ruined. I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Yeah, that seems like the appropriate reaction. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, your sin atoned for. This whole scene reminds me of the call of Moses. We've got fire. There's a holy space. There's an action of purification, the removing of sandals and the burning coal. And then there's a call to step into a God-given purpose. But here is the difference. Verse eight, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. Isaiah is instantly all in. He commits right away. He doesn't even know yet what God wants him to do. When we trust God and know who he is, we aren't hesitant to serve him. The more you know God, the more you are sure of God's call in your life. Let's recap these two conversations. There's a summary here of the conversation. Moses says, here I am. Oh, but who am I to do this? And for that matter, who are you? And what if they don't accept me? And you know, I don't speak very well. You should send someone else. Isaiah says, here I am, send me. Both callings demonstrate God's sovereignty and his willingness to use flawed humans to accomplish his purposes. Do you remember my father's prayer? Lord, I'll go if you want me to. It turns out that was a pious sounding, but ultimately untrusting prayer. My father changed his prayer when he realized this because God's stirring in his heart had been quite clear. And so together, our whole family prayed, instead, Lord, we will go unless you stop us. And that made all the difference. Perceived barriers vaporized, funds were raised in excess of the need, doors were opened in astounding ways. That was 1995. And at the end of last year, my father retired after nearly 30 years as a full support raising card carrying missionary. He's here this morning. Dad, thanks for being here and thanks for an example of faithfulness. Today is Serve Your World Sunday at Fellowship. We do this a couple times a year to let you know about what God's doing around the world and what fellowship's up to. So I'm gonna mention some ways fellowship is currently serving around the world and invite you to consider participating with God in this and invite you in. But let me be clear, my invitation to you isn't the same as God's calling. I'll let the Holy Spirit and you have a conversation together about how you should respond. Not everyone is called to go, but we are all called to serve in some way. Fellowship is mostly focused on pastor training and leader development, and much of our efforts are in the developing world. We have four very deep strategic partnerships, and we support about 20 individual missionaries around the globe. This isn't gonna be all that fellowship is up to. I'm just gonna give you some highlights and some current areas of need. 
So there's three categories of requests for you. First is to pray and encourage. We're going to add a pre-post slide to the slides before and after the service each week. This is an example of one of them. They're going to include one of our missionaries each week, so you can be more aware of who we support and how you can pray with and for them. Also, life groups or families, would you be interested and willing to put together a care package with notes of encouragement and prayers and scriptures and gifts that we could send to some of our missionaries? If you'd be open to do that, I'd love to talk with you about that and assign your life group a missionary to bundle a care package gift to so that they can be encouraged that we see them and know what they're doing. Second category is you can give. A couple of different ways you can do that. There's a village in northern Nicaragua right on the border of Honduras called Somotillo. And about five years ago, we began a very deep partnership with them. Part of that partnership was a connection with Compassion International, where you can pick and sponsor a, a child by helping provide some encouragement, some connection, and some funds for some of the basic needs these children have. And so Compassion was here several years ago, four or five years ago, and in one Sunday, this congregation sponsored all of the available children in the entire village. And today, we still sponsor 129 children in Somatillo, Nicaragua. However, since then, more children have been born or moved or aged into the program. And so there are currently today 60 kids, here's some of them, who are not sponsored, but they're in Somotillo. The commitment to sponsoring is that you'd send messages occasionally. You can use the Compassion app. You write a message, they'll translate it and deliver it for you to the child you're sponsoring. And then the child you're sponsoring can write back a message and they'll translate it and get it to you. And then also there's a financial contribution of $43 a month. And you can do that directly through Compassion. If you're interested in doing that, I can give you a link where you can connect and talk or look through a list of children that are currently available in the village that we've done a lot of work in. That's one of the ways you can give. Another is, did you know that when you give to fellowship, you can choose where that money goes? You can choose our general fund, and that's where your money should be going, but if you wanna give above and beyond, you can pick a drop-down box and choose our care fund or our missions fund. I just typed a random number in there for the screenshot. <laughs> but you can select missions and give wherever you'd, wherever you'd like to. Uh, and that might be something if you have a calling for over and above giving and you'd like to support the mission work we're doing. Speaking of that, let me give you one very specific example, which is a timely need. We have one of our deepest partnerships is in India. There is a ministry there that we helped start in 2007. And this is not a ministry that is supported by many churches. It is a ministry supported exclusively by Fellowship Dallas, by us. And here is a photo of what we've built there. It is a two-story building, and these are students going to this school. Most of their parents do not speak English and are illiterate, uh, even in their own language. And so these kids are changing a generation and we have built a private school there for them. It's a two-story building. There's 250 students that just started school. Their school system time is different than ours, and they just started a couple weeks ago. And this is a recent photo. But this building also needs a third floor. That has always been the plan. The third floor is going to be a place to train pastors. India is one of the most persecuted and most dangerous places to be a pastor and a Christian today. And the plan has always been to build a third floor that can be a safe pastor training facility. Right now they can only use the school building for that during spring break and fall break, essentially. But with a third floor, they'll be able to do it year round. If the Holy Spirit was so moved, we're trying to expedite our timeline on being able to build that building and do it quickly because of some of the restrictions they're facing there. And so we could use some significant above and beyond gift donations, beyond your regular giving, to help make that happen. I'd like to talk to you about that if you're interested in doing that. The third category of how you can be involved in what fellowship is doing is you can go. And we have some upcoming mission trips. 
I mentioned Nicaragua, Somatillo. We don't just sponsor kids through compassion there. We also go and send two or three teachers twice a year to teach and train pastors. And that is open to anyone in the congregation. If you feel a calling and a gifting in teaching and you would like to go, you don't have to know Spanish. We'll have a translator for you. You don't have to be a seminary graduate. There is a set curriculum and you can go. There's a trip in August that is filled now, but the next one will probably be in February. And so if you would like to do that, we'd like to know that and I'd like to talk with you about it. Two other trips that are coming up this fall. Young adults, this is for you. We're organizing a trip for young adults to Panama uh, in October, uh, November 8th through the 13th to connect with an unreached, unserved people group in a region of Panama that deeply need the love of Jesus. And it's just for young adults. There'll be more on that coming. And then women, we have one for the women's ministry here. We're taking a trip this fall to Costa Rica in October 7th through the 13th. Some of you have been to Costa Rica before. And so there's an opportunity to go and serve. You don't need to know Spanish for these, although it's a bonus if you do. As my father has told me, 90% of missions is just showing up, willing to go and be there and encourage, even if you feel inadequate. As the band comes back up, let's take a moment to each reflect on God's call. And if you're being called to pray or to give or to go, I'll be back with a final word in a moment. Let's sing this together. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who oh, the sun sets free. Oh, his free. I'm a child of God, yes I am. Free at last, He has ransomed me. His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, He died.
all the earth. bit hard on Moses this morning. On one hand, I really think he deserves it. But here's the miraculous thing. In Hebrews chapter 11, we find the hall of faith. It's a list of God's mightiest heroes. It lists Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, who by faith did amazing things for Christ. And then we come to verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along uh, with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. In faith, he left Egypt not fearing the king's anger, he pers persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Moses was mightily used by God because even though he was reluctant and anxious, he chose to trust and serve God. As you leave today, there are some arrows on the ground leading you to the serve wall here on the second concourse where there's information about all of our missionaries and how you can pray for them and some details about everything I've talked about, including I will be there. And if you'd like to talk about any of these things, I'd like to talk with you too. And if God is stirring in your heart to take one of those actions, I'd like to know about it. And you can do that in person or you can fill out one of these serve cards. There's not a spot specifically for missions, but if you just write it on the card and give it to somebody on staff, it'll get to me. Pray with me. Lord, please make us a people who know you and trust you so that we say, here I am, send me. Amen. Come meet me over at the serve wall, or if you're new here, don't forget to go to Discover. Thank you. You're dismissed.